Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to our fifth installment of celebrating the achievements of innovators and in pests and vector control. Before we get started, we're going to go over a few housekeeping rules. Please, everyone, mute your line. If you have any questions, you can enter them in the chat box and we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions that are not answered, you can email them to us at education at nola.gov and we will be recording and posting this webinar on our YouTube channel. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Claudia Regal, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you so much, Estacia. Welcome everyone. Yes, I'm Claudia Regal, the Director of City of New Orleans Mosquito and Termite Control Board. And it is my great pleasure today uh, to be introducing Dr. Donald uh, W. Dixon. So uh, well-known nematologist uh, here at the University of Florida and really important, my PhD advisor. Absolutely. <laughs> that has helped me all these years. So I think this is gonna be just a, a really interesting um, you know, just talk about your life and, you know, where you are even today, because uh, I know you're doing so much. And again, everyone, welcome. If you have questions, please put them in the chat um, of the of Teams, and we're going to answer those questions at the very end. So, Dr. Dixon, again, thank you so much for joining us today. We happen to be in your office, right? I think I've spent lots of time here over the years in this office, <laughs> which is great. Thank you very much, Claudia. I appreciate this opportunity and thank everybody for listening in and uh -huh. we'll do the best we can to <laughs> entertain you, I think. <laughs> I think there's going to be some good stories here. So, yeah. OK, well, good. Let's start at the very beginning here. And uh, you're originally, I mean, you've been in Florida for many, many years, but you're originally from? Tennessee. Right, Dixon, Tennessee for that. And uh, we can see some photographs of you as a, a tiny tot, I think. Yeah. Um, maybe, is that two years old? Something like that? Something maybe. like that, yeah. <laughs> uh, In Dixon, Tennessee. Can you tell everybody a little bit about um, the photographs and who the, the people are? Well, there's my mother and uh, myself and my older sister and my younger sister. So we were raised without a father. And that always, I'm sorry, but that always makes me very sad. Sorry. But uh, we have to get over that and, yeah. and, and, and move on because my father was murdered when I was four years old. My goodness. I was born on a, a you heard that song, Rocky Knob <laughs> from Tennessee? <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the uh, song for the University of Tennessee. A rocky knob. I was born on a rocky knob. Truly, that's the truth. All the houses back in the 19, early 18, late 1800s, early 1900s were built around a spring because there was no running water, no electricity. And so that's quite a, a difference in that period of time sure. and, and the period of time today. Okay. And um, God, I think another, I love this picture of you. I think you probably were maybe four or five years I old. I might have been four or five yeah, years old. Great yes. photograph. It looks like you might be up to some trouble there, Dr. Dixon. I was just joking. We, we, <laughs> moved, we, we moved from the country to the city after my father was murdered. And uh, my mother had to take a job. But she wasn't educated. And so that made life pretty, pretty difficult for yeah, us. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think if we move to the next photograph, I was uh, very fortunate to meet your mother, Mama Hayes. Yes. We actually spent a lot of time. I know she had moved down to Gainesville for a while. And I think we need to let everybody know that um, you were a 13-pound baby. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> well, and it did a lot of ma a lot of damage to oh, Mama Hayes. I tell you that. Now, Mama Hayes gets that name because she remarried after 30 years. Of, of raising us kids, and um, so then yeah. life changed considerably at that point uh, for Mama A's, and then she got elderly, and I took care of her for seven years. Yeah, she and, was here, so sweet. I know I was actually in school during that time, so yes. it was really wonderful to hear a lot of the stories, <laughs> I think, of when you were growing up. Um, you have two wonderful children. I've met them both. Go to the next slide. Uh, Kimberly and Jeffrey. Yes. We'll talk a little yes. bit about them. These are pictures in their younger years. That's correct. Um, yes. But, uh, Kimberly lives here, right, in Gainesville? 
Kimberly still lives in Gainesville, Florida, and she's a school teacher. Mm -hmm. And my son works for a, a company that does compressors. He's actually a boss now, and he lives in Spring Hill, Tennessee. Yes. That is wonderful. A really fast growing area of Tennessee, yes. I tell you that, okay? And um, I know you have two wonderful grandchildren. I yes. do, yeah. <laughs> that's Alex pictures. and Emma, and then my son, Jeffrey. And that's, uh, they come to visit once or twice a year, yeah. okay? And so they're both now big boy and big girl. And uh, uh, Alex there is going to the University of Tennessee. And my granddaughter is going back to school to become a teacher. Right. Yes. So that's good. So I'm sure they went to Disney on every trip. Were they lucky enough? Uh, they, they, <laughs> they, spent, they have spent their fair share of time at Disney World. Oh, that's that's great. Thing, yes. That's wonderful. Well, yeah. good. And so we've got some pictures from you when you were a young boy in, uh, I believe this is in Dixon, Tennessee. Yes, that's uh, probably an elementary uh, school photograph. You know, I'm lucky to have those old photographs because during that period of time, baby, we didn't have cameras and phones. And so it was a, a completely different world uh, back in that era. And, you know, I grew up with some really good kids and I'm very fortunate. That is awesome. And so I, I, I think you went to Dixon, so you stayed there, obviously, through high school. So God, um, I know you were you love sports, even to today. I mean, I think everyone knows this, but you are a season ticket holder for the, the Gators. That's right, both right? basketball and football. That's right. And so I think for you're, like 50 years. That's incredible. <laughs> so that's awesome. And so you started liking football, obviously, in school. I was a pretty good football player. Mm -hmm. I, I can brag on myself. And, and our teams, uh, two years in a row, were undefeated and we got invited to bowl games. So right. it was a big deal for a small town like Dixon, Tennessee. And then I was elected to be on the all mid state team in 1956. Oh. And believe it or not, uh, a little small guy like me, I played defensive end and an offensive tackle. <laughs> <laughs> There's another photograph of, I think it's at your graduation from high school. These are great photos. 1957. And so did you like school? What, what, did you like science? Well, I mean, you know, as an undergraduate student, I'm ashamed to say I was a terrible student. Okay. Oh, yeah. and, and then when I got into high school, I became a little better. And then as we progress, I came even much better. <laughs> Did you like science at that time, or did you, I, did you, you know, know you were going to go I had a leaning towards science, uh -huh. and I had a leaning about wanting, you know, to, I just, I've always craved knowledge. Yeah. And that's, that is great. Yeah. That's good. We've got a nice photograph. Um, you had told me that you go to your uh, high school reunions on a regular basis, and so. I do. That We've is been super. having reunions, I guess, since. Maybe when we were 35 years out, wow. and they they actually meet every year. Wow. Uh, so I try to go when I can. That's really yeah. great. I've never been to a high school reunion. I think <laughs> I probably should go. <laughs> it's quite a few uh, years. It's uh, amazing how many of those people have gone. Oh, that's yeah. terrible. Yeah. It's terrible. Okay, so you finished your high school. You're still in Dixon. And then um, you're going to go to college, but before that, you worked at a Ford plant, correct? Yeah, I, when I was uh, a junior and senior in high school, I became a lifeguard at a state park. Oh, okay. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> and I met the uh, one of the high-ranking individuals at Ford Motor Company. They were building a glass division in, <laughs> in Nashville, Tennessee, and he invited all us lifeguards to apply for jobs up there. And he gave us, uh, and so that was a summer job for me. And then I decided to go to school and I chose Murray State, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And it was just a happenstance that I, actually I had gotten, <laughs> this is an interesting part of this. I had received a scholarship to go play football at Austin P State University uh, College. It was a college at that time. Mm -hmm. And I got injured. And, and this is a true story. I went in to see the doctor. They sent me to see the doctor. And for some strange reason, which we'll never be able to explain, <clears throat> he took an interest in me. 
Um, <laughs> one of the problems I have is I'm very emotional. And uh, it's like a disease. <laughs> oh, no, it's all good. It's all good, Dr. Dixon. You know, we're talking about the past. You know, it's hard. Uh, yeah, but the, uh, the doctor taught me in going to school. Oh, that's and great. And not being a sports enthusiast, but <laughs> rather <laughs> to dedicate myself to education. What, that's what uh, it is. Boy, what good <laughs> advice, right? So that's so great. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm emotional. Oh. It's a... Uh, it's always been that way. It's all good. So, you know, that's wonderful, though, that you were able to look at everybody. You know, I think that goes through this process. We have some sort of mentor. And we're going to start crying here, but you are, you have been one of my mentors, right? And I think, you know, these people that help propel you to sort of the next step, you do it, I do it. But we all have these folks that are, you know, it's something that maybe someone says or something that they do uh, well, or open that door, which is great. I, you know, it's it's uh, uh, impossible to explain why uh, the emotions are there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, anyway, Murray State <laughs> was a great place for me yeah. to land, okay? And, and I did well. If I'm bragging on myself, I did well. I was surprised. <laughs> I was actually surprised in myself. And so I went two years and then some things happened with the family and I owed some money because of some things that happened in the family. So I went back to Ford. They hired me back there. I worked wow. two years. I know what it's like to work midnights. I know what it's like to work the day shift. I know what it's like to work the alternating shifts where you work days, nights and, and afternoons. And I didn't like it particularly, I'll tell you that right now. Uh, I learned a, a lot of hard lessons that uh, you, you can only learn at a place like that about what unions are and, and what the employees are like. And it's not all good, okay? But that's another story. Anyway, I needed to return to school. And one of the other strange events in my life happened when the uh, director of the, uh, what do we call it, Claudia? <laughs> when, you, when you're going to get drafted, the draft board, the lady with the draft board called me up and told me that I was going to be drafted into the service. And she said, are you going to go back to school? If you go back to school, you'll get a deferment. And I said, I'm going to go back to school. I didn't know how because I didn't have any money. But, uh, Again, another luck and, uh, yeah. lucky break in my family. I went to Murray State and no no money. And I went to Austin P, which uh -huh. is 35 miles from Dixon, Tennessee, and located in Clarksville, Tennessee. And the dean of students says, we got a national defense loan, son, and I can offer you this loan. And I went back to school. That is great. That's a good story. That is for sure. <laughs> and what did you major in while you were there? A uh, distributed major in science, and that means you got to have so many hours in chemistry and biology and botany and so that was a great physics and mathematics, and so on. it was a good challenging program. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And then um, I think you had another great opportunity going to Oklahoma, right? Oklahoma State University. And there's a good story about that one too, because when I graduated from Austin P, I was uh, ready to go to work. I had a, a, I had a wife and a baby, and uh, I was offered three different jobs, okay? And uh, I went in to talk to my professor in microbiology, who I really liked, and he said, have you thought about going to graduate school? And really, I, I didn't even know what graduate school was. <laughs> and he gave me some pamphlets. I applied to all of those schools. I think it was like five. Believe it or not, I was accepted. I'm bragging about myself now. <laughs> you should. I was bragging about myself, but I was accepted in all of them. And I, I couldn't believe it. I said, well, maybe I got something to give here. And so I chose Oklahoma State because it was plant pathology. I didn't know what plant pathology was, but boy, was it a good decision. I love plant pathology. Really liked it. And it was uh, just perfect for me. And Dr. Struble was my major professor, and he was wonderful and encouraging, and I did good. 
Oh, that's great. And yeah. you worked with potatoes and root non nematode, huh? Yeah, I did was an it ecological non? study on root non nematodes. Oh, and, boy. Uh, I met Dr. Joe Sasser there, and he uh, liked my presentation. I went and made a presentation yeah. at uh, APS, American Pathological Society. And Dr. Sasser said, I'd like for you to come over and be my student at North Carolina State. And then I met Dr. Van Gundy. I'm and getting goosebumps, Dr. Riverside. <laughs> and he offered me an opportunity to go there too. So I had the choice and I chose North Carolina State and I'm very proud that I did. And uh, that was in 1965. 65, yeah, because yeah. you graduated. Next slide. So you graduated um, from NC State in, I think, 1968. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. So I was two years at Oklahoma State and three years at uh, North Carolina State. Right. And I encouraged all students to get done in two years and three <laughs> years. <laughs> I did not finish in three years, but you, you, I survived. Okay, so you, you can't might do it. You fly yourself. Yes. <laughs> you definitely could. And yeah. I mean, for I think all the nematologists that are on on this call, I mean, what an unbelievable opportunity, right, to work with um, Dr. Joe Sasser, and then also really with electrophoresis. And well, then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and something very important about yeah. being at North Carolina State because they had the best nematology program probably in the world and that they had Dr. Hirschman, a renowned morphologist there, and uh, Dr. Triana Flew, who was the world's authority on mode of reproduction and uh, with nematodes and uh, chromosome numbers of nematodes. And Joe Sasser was a world authority on root mount nematodes, and they had... Uh, Dick Powell, who was an authority on uh, uh, how nematodes were any act, interacting with fungi. Mm -hmm. And then they had Dr. Barker, who was the world's yeah. authority on ecology. And so, you know, I can't deny that I had some of the best training that Absolutely. one can receive in nematology. Absolutely. I mean, what an opportunity. Yeah. And I think uh, for the next slide, if anyone is interested, I was sort of perusing the North uh, NC State uh, websites and this is what I found. So they actually have some information on Joe Sasser and I'm sure some of the um, more information on some of these other uh, nematologists as well, which is interesting. So, you know, uh, Claude, if I can yeah. interrupt there, uh, Dr. Sasser was always trying to build nematology and did a great job with that. But as a result of my thesis work using electrophoresis oh, yeah. to identify Melodogon species, and by the way, that's held up for the last 50 plus years, okay? And and uh, he used that as a basis, believe it or not, he used that as a basis to build his international Melodogon project. Wow. How about that? Amazing. It is amazing. I'm just absolutely. The because he, he could sell it that, you know, he had a good method other than using morphology to identify nematode. This was all pre-DNA, okay? Right. <laughs> Just a few years before. <laughs> Pre-DNA, yeah. And I, I have that written in my thesis that someday we'll be using DNA, and that was in 1967, okay? And it was shortly after there that they, and by the way, when you, with the type of electrophoresis that I did, it was a homemade kit, okay? <laughs> it wasn't this beautiful bile red kit that you buy, and it was not slab gel electrophoresis. It was really hardcore work, okay, to do that because we had this, uh, you had these tubes and everything was homemade. And I used to get electrocuted uh, by putting my hands in the buffer accidentally. And I extracted nematodes. Oh, how many females did I ever extract? It's incredible numbers, okay? Incredible numbers that I had to take to get that electrophoresis to work. But it worked. And it's held up. And it's held up. Yeah, I'm very proud of that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And so then from there, um, found an interesting letter with a, a job offer here at the University of Florida. Yeah. Right? How cool yeah, is that? Yeah, how cool was that? And it was a governor at the I time. Didn't, I didn't have to go do a postdoc. <laughs> you know, that was yeah. wonderful. And I, I had the opportunity to take a job at Rutgers. Mm -hmm. 
before I took this job in plant pathology. And uh, I'm very happy that I did. All right, it all worked out good. And so 1969, uh, January 1969, I started working in plant pathology. And I was working on agronomic crops. And of course, there was no bigger crop for me to work on than peanut and soybean. And I was doing fungicide work right off the bat, right. you know. And this is a, a letter from the governor of the state of Florida. <laughs> How cool is that? It is. Uh, that's the only letter I've ever seen. From Original. That. And I saw the letter. It wasn't even stamped or anything. It was actually signed. <laughs> it was actually <laughs> signed by Claude Kirk, who was the, the governor of the state of Florida at that time. I'll bring that. And, and, and at that time, Florida was in a throw of growing. We had a new vice president, Dr. E.T. York, and he received funding to hire a lot of new faculty, and he joined together extension and uh, research and teaching into one conglomerate that he called IPAS, Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. And so he was a great man and did a great job for the, for the University of Florida. And when I came to University of Florida and I left NC State, mm -hmm. it was so different. It was just really different. I, I won't go into all the little details. <laughs> yeah, sure, so. We've been, University of Florida has been building over these last uh, 55 years, okay? And it's made great improvements. I mean, I know the campus, we, we actually took a ride today around campus. Yeah. It's, it's almost unrecognizable with the amount of growth just yeah. since I've been here, left, right? Which is yeah. what, 22 years ago. But I, where were you on campus during that time? Well, I, I started out, it was not very good facilities for me. <laughs> it was terrible facilities. I had, by the way, I had no technician. I had no startup money. <laughs> you had to do it yourself. I had no vehicle. Yeah. And so you had to build everything yourself over time, yeah. space. And, and so it all ended up good. And then I think here at the university, you jumped into nematology extension, right? I left, uh, there was an opportunity. Right. And I went to talk to the chairperson in entomology at that time. Mm -hmm. I told him that my love was to work with nematodes and he hired me. Much to the faculty's chagrin because <laughs> I didn't go through an interview process. And so I became the extension nematologist and there I was responsible for the entire state, all crops, citrus, turf grasses, home lawns, and everything was so different in that period of time because home lawns was a big business for nematodes, okay? Because they, they just, devil, I mean, there's no place in the world probably has more damage on turf grass than the state of Florida, okay? And you, in this photograph here, that's, very innovative equipment for applying uh, DBCP. Uh, most people, nematologists today, don't know what DBCP is because it, it went away in 1977. <laughs> and so we had developed it as a kingpin for nematode control on turf grass, and it was like magic, believe it or not. It was so good. and. Uh, that growers, superintendents were so happy. We were applying it on home lawns. And in 19, well, I guess it was 1976, they began to recognize that this compound was moving into the groundwater. Yeah. And that was a bad deal. It was a cancer causing agent, according to the data from uh, EPA. Right. And so in 1977, it got suspended. Mm -hmm. And that changed everything. <laughs> so then we moved over to ethylene dibromide, and it was fairly efficacious. And then for a long period of time, um, I mentioned it to Dow Chemical Company about our work in the 1970s. I guess this was sometime in the 80s mm -hmm. uh, that telone could be used on the same way mm -hmm. with not quite the efficacy, mm -hmm. uh, and you were going to get some damage but it would work. And so they've been using telone on golf courses in the state of Florida mm -hmm. since that period of time. Since that time. And so from extension, um, 
I think it was we had it in 1976, right? I think you well, you've always done extension, even that was a research, right. exactly. research and teaching appointment. I've always always done extension extension. Work. And I have, and I have, and let me just say one thing. I really appreciate, I think for the folks that are on the line, you know, you always put the students out in front of growers, in front of, you know, different people to do that extension, right? Yeah, do that right. transfer knowledge, right. learn. Yeah. So even though it was research and all that, extension is just part, I think, of who you are, right? Well, yeah, I love it, actually. Yeah. It, 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 it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm a plant pathologist who works on nematodes, right. who believes in, in controlling, managing yeah. plant diseases. I mean, right. it's that simple. That's what we're all about. There's, you know, and so I, I did like it. I did love it. There's there's one one little story. So I was I forget even when it was, but we had a you had a group of growers out on the research farm and you're like, Claudia, go get the go get the tractor. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. I go out there and I drive the tractor up in front of the group, right? And everyone's looking, but you know, we appreciate that. So um Anyway, so yeah, so then I think you were working, well, you worked with a lot of different things, but peanut, corn, I know I worked with peanuts, right? But um, soybean, tobacco, those are all huge crops here in Florida. And in the early 1970s, soybean <laughs> was a major crop for Florida, and it was a, a, a very important industry, and it was yeah. a, very challenging to control the soybean cyst nematode, the root knot nematode, and the... Uh, uh, other nematodes that would affect, including sting nematodes on soybeans, and they came clamoring to the dean of extension in, in the University of Florida, wanting results for nem nematology, and I was under a lot of pressure. And believe it or not, another fortuitous event: uh, the the breeder came up with a new variety of soybean. He called it Forest. And it had multiple disease control, including mm -hmm. uh, soybean cyst nematode and root knot nematode, uh, fairly effective. Okay, and so that helped a bunch. <laughs> I'm telling you, it helped a bunch. And but then shortly, soybean in Florida disappeared. I guess about 1977 or 78. Why? Couldn't compete against the Midwest. Uh, yields were just not that good, and we had to put more input into that crop, and so it faded over all these years. So the University of Florida, I think, you know, for me, I was, I feel very fortunate to have been able to go to school here, obviously because of you, but also with the other nematologists that work here. I mean, this photograph that's coming up on the next slide is pre my time, but I was able to meet all of them, right, and have these interactions. And so, of course, we've got you and Dr. Smart and Dr. McSorley and Dr. Don and Dr. Tarjan. But yeah, yeah, because you know, I was teaching plant nematology. Dr. Right. Smart was teaching morphology and anatomy. And Dr. McSorley was teaching ecology, and Dr. Tarjan was teaching marine nematology. And so, with that kind of a, a group, you're you're you're. The students are getting more than just one person teaching them plant Absolutely. nematology. And there are others, Dr. Kuhn as well. Dr. Kuhn was uh, very active in animal pathogenic nematode, right. and he was a, a real genius about that Absolutely. work. Yes, sir. And then the, the researchers at DPI? We had Dr. O'Bannon and yeah. uh, Dr. Esser and uh, Dr. Inceras. Dr. Insera and it, we had we got a lot of expertise in nematology here at the University of Florida. Really, yeah. I think you know during my time in the what 1994, no six, <laughs> 1996 <laughs> and 2000, right? So we're right around there. All these folks were still here. That's right. And so I really feel as this what was, I think the experience that you had at NC State, I feel as though I had that experience here. Right. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Amazing. They had some good teachers. There's Very no doubt much about so. it. They were all dedicated yeah. to the science. And right. to the students. I and mean, to just the students. Absolutely. That includes the students. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> science and the students. All right. So we've got some photographs of you and I think a couple of paper um, little clips here. I know you were very involved in the Society of Nematology and ANTA and also even at the state level as well. I, that's right. I was. Uh, uh, 
elected president of the Society of Nematologists, I think in 1980 or 81. Uh -huh. Yeah. That was a long time ago, and yeah. um, I uh, made my contribution. That's what <laughs> I made my contribution to the society yeah. because I was the editor and then editor in chief for yeah. too many years. I tell you, it, it took a lot of work. I a think lot we, of work. We've got a, the next slide, but we've got, of course, you've won many awards. I'm looking at just a, a well, you, the, I think the audience doesn't see, but I'm we're in your office, right? So I yeah. see a wall of all kinds of awards from, you know, glo uh, international, local, it's all there. But I think people really need to make sure that they understand your role here um, with, with editing and mm -hmm. with writing. So everyone on the audience, I suffered a lot. <laughs> We've got editor in chief here, okay? And so my, my so you used to use green ink, all right? So I would turn in, uh, my things here. Why don't you read this, Dr. Dixon? And it would come back as a sea of green. All right. So it was really, you know, actually pretty comical. <laughs> so I still like to use green ink. But maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the journal and um, I think your contribution and all the years of being an editor and getting that journal. Up you know, uh, Claudia, I was not good in English. <laughs> I wouldn't <laughs> not, know. <laughs> but I worked hard at it. I'll tell you that. It was a lot of work. It was a lot yes, of work. it was. But and, it paid and, off with those and, journals, right? Yeah, we, at, at one time, we were getting, like, when I was editor in chief, we were getting four issues out a year, and they would average 20 to 30 articles in each one of those. And you're responsible for reviewing every one of those papers and making sure they're technically correct. And so it's a chore, yeah. no doubt about it. So but it was an enjoyable chore, let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Getting that work out. Yeah. Um, so I think in, uh, I think a big issue obviously was methyl bromide, looking for methyl bromide alternatives, right? And actually, <clears throat> This is pre my time, but actually I rode that wave, <laughs> you know, with my project. I so said we'll talk about that in a little bit. But do you want to talk a little bit about the importance of the bromide alternatives and what was going on uh, during that time? Well, beginning in 1977, with the loss of DBCP, it just yeah. seemed to have been an erosion of the best pesticides that we ever had for managing nematodes, and so including the organophosphates, the carbamates and the soil fumigants and uh, methyl bromide without question was it, it was the you know premier product for multi-purpose nematode soil borne diseases weeds okay and some lesser known insects in the soil and it it began development this is an interesting aspect it began development in, in the early 1970s by Dr. Uh, Mrs. Overman down at Bradington uh -huh. and Mr. Jones, Dr. Jones at, at down there. They recognized the, the, this product working with the chemical industry, okay? They were promoting this and it turned out to be the best product ever for managing all these pests on the high value. Sure. Um, vegetable crops in particular, okay? And they melded that technology with the uh, polyethylene film mulch mm -hmm. and drip irrigation or surface irrigation, whichever was available in those fields. And so it was the mainstay for all of those years. And then 1993, you know, it was a sudden clap. Wow, when we got called to Washington, D.C., and they said this product is going to be suspended, you know, in 15 years, totally taken off the market. Mm -hmm. Well, the industry was really upset. <laughs> I was a part of that, and I heard these drawers, and some of the remarks they made, we won't repeat here, but uh, they wanted alternatives, okay? And so beginning in 1993, I put in my first field plot with polyethylene film. I've never done this in my life. And we, and, and this is another really wild story because at that time, that night, we had the storm of the century to come through the Gainesville, Florida from the West Coast to the East Coast. And I don't know where my plastic film went. I don't know where my drip station went to. 
it literally blew all of that stuff away. Oh it was, I was out there at six o'clock in the morning and I couldn't hardly stand up in the field because of the wind. Wow. But that was a lesson learned because I, I fumigated that day with methyl bromide, different rates, and the efficacy, whether the, the plastic was there or not, was just so good. It was, I, I was so impressed. I was really impressed of the efficacy. What happens with methyl bromide, it flashes through the soil so mm -hmm. quickly and reducing all those pests. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the mainstay. That was why it was so good. <laughs> We kind of picture actually the next slide just to give an example here of you know for the people that are on the audience i mean you've got an untreated plot right versus a treated, a treated plot, area yeah. and it's just it's like night and day i mean nuts said just takes over plots yeah so um okay well good let's look at some more uh, i think we've got some more field pictures because this is how i spent my time here <laughs> Is in the field, right? I think all the students. Well, Claudia hands. learned a lot about soil fumigation. I sure did. Yeah. I think I learned a lot. Learned a lot about a lot of things in she, agriculture. She developed was. a new method of applying telone using pear chisels uh, to keep. One of the problems with telone, it yeah. flashes through the soil, but it wants to come out of the soil so rapidly, and so it's very difficult to keep it in the soil. And so pear chisels was one way to do that developed with Claudia and, and then our agricultural engineer working together. Yes, it was very good. So that was a good This context. photograph is in February, fumigating in Florida in February, and it can be cold. And as you can see there, <laughs> it, it is cold. What is, what is cold, Dr. Dixon? Well, cold, <laughs> cold would be 40. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's put that 40, into perspective, yeah, that was, yeah. <laughs> which is good. Awesome. So lots of field work. I think all of most, a lot of most of your students that have come through here have done some sort of field work. But I think, you know, again, look, I think it's so important. You've done so many. We do a lot of company work as well at the city of New Orleans. Yeah. And a lot of it I learned from you, right, yeah. Yeah. is how to set trials up and it just manage the whole thing from start to finish. That's and I right. think it's really important that we continue to have those we need the field work done. Well, that's right. We've had a, a real flurry of new chemistry to come out in the last 20 years. Right. And all of that had to be trialed mm -hmm. and studied. And uh, I ran so many field trials. I don't have any idea. I mean, well, it was hundreds, okay? Uh, yeah, a lot. Yeah. And so the other thing is, I just, we had uh, one of the sites, uh, one of the field research sites, we actually had to abandon that particular field plot. Do you remember? Because Pasturia penetrans yeah, right. had yeah. really gone in there. The game super suppressive. Super suppressive. And I think it's important. You've done so much work um, with the bio bio biological control agent. And you've had students uh, working with Pasturia. So postdocs. Yeah, postdocs. Yeah. A lot of work. Business scientists. Yes. Yeah. So if anyone's interested, there's a review. I put a, a, a journal article there that That's right. um, you guys wrote. That's right. um, I think if you're interested, um, I don't know if you want to mention anything else about Pasturia. Well, we worked on it for like 25 years yeah. and it's it's a real challenge. I ain't no doubt right. about that. And then industry got involved and that sort of shut down our program because mm -hmm. we couldn't compete uh, against right. what the industry funding was. Uh, they took away <laughs> industry. That's one of those bad things. Industry uh, took away my funding for working on Pasteuria. And then we were not super successful in getting funding from USDA or other sources. So uh, uh, we man managed to do a lot of work with it, but over time we uh, just couldn't compete. So um, it never really got commercialized, but I think it's such an interesting, you know, bacterium that. People want to read more about well, it. The problem with it is that it's very specific to yeah. the nematodes, and nobody been able to crack that nut. So mm -hmm. um, it's it's a real challenge. And I, I had some great collaboration yeah. and within the department, within uh, uh, um, microbiology, working mm -hmm. with this organism. And um, so we know it's a challenge, but it's it is very very suppressive. That's right. And um, I'm I'm talking about taking a severe feel of root knot nematode right down to, you can't hardly detect a nematode in that field. And that exceptionally good, no oh, doubt yeah. about it, you know. 
but uh, growing the stuff and applying it and make it work. Uh, we can move it. We did transfer it to uh -huh. a field and showed it to build up and be suppressive. And we published that work. Uh, George Karaoke from Kenya did that work and it was a very nice study. So I think uh, when you have some nematologists around, we're going to go to the next slide. Um, I think it's when you look, you will find. <laughs> so we've got a next slide. So there are a lot of folks doing taxonomy around here. Uh, Stacy, if you could move to the next slide. Maybe it's hung up. Let's see what's going on. <clears throat> Hopefully it's working. There she goes. All right, cool. So I think it's like anything, right? Once you start looking, you're going to find something. <laughs> so this, we were, this is actually a picture I took this morning, right? Looking at your yard. Right. That's in my home. That's a laurel oak tree. And it's very thin in the foliage, even though it, <laughs> yeah. there's a hickory tree right beside it. Okay. That tree is absolutely plastered. The roots I'm talking about now are plastered with a species in nematode that we identified as Melodigan partitala. And that was the first report of this nematode on laurel. Why this is important? Because this nematode is a very important parasite on pecans in the southeastern United States, okay? And what we think happens, and this needs research, is that they go in and clear these forests of laurel oaks, and, and there's partitala there, and then that jumps on the pecan tree and becomes a detriment to these growers, okay? And we're in an emphasis stage with learning about this. And it's uh, it just goes to show you sometimes you just find nematodes in the most weird places on weird hosts. <laughs> and that's one of them right there. In, in the yard. And so, it's, yeah. one of the things, Claudia, about this nematode is that it's specific. Yeah. Uh, and we can't grow it on tomato. So we can't take this thing to the greenhouse and okay. build it up and do all of the work like we can with Javonica yeah. or Arenaria or Incognita. And so, you know, it's, it, it, you have to, and that, by the way, mm -hmm. I took pecan seedlings and planted them around that tree right there and they became uh, infected by root knot nematode and gall by root knot right. nematode. So the nematode that's on that oak tree definitely goes to pecan. Definitely goes to okay. Pecan. So over the many years, we, I know you've had lots of students. And so, <laughs> ah, do you, there I am. This is my crew. <laughs> I'm like <laughs> up in the upper, what, right hand side. Uh, but oh, those yeah. were during yeah. my time, right? So this is in the late 90s or so, but we've Crow, got yeah, 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 the yeah, Rotus yeah. and Fahim and, and Billy Crow and Janetti and me and I think Jennifer is her name, yeah. but um, always lots of students around. Uh, to me, that was just a great time, obviously. Um, but this yeah. was at a meeting. I forget which, probably an SON meeting. I don't probably. remember where this one specifically was, but really appreciate, again, you always taking the students, right? And yeah. making us do presentations and getting out in front of other researchers That's and right. talk about That's collaboration. Right. Yeah. And so, Miss so Claudia here, Dr. Claudia Rigo, got a nice job <laughs> <laughs> right off the bat. <laughs> I do like and that I don't think, Claudia, you did not have to go through a postdoc either. I did not. Oh, man, they, were, they were eager to hire you and they saw how good you were. And, <laughs> And I'm very proud of that aspect because I've had several students like that that got a job right away because they would tell me, the industry would say, well, we know they work for Dixon. <laughs> that they're they good. were well trained, they're right? They're good, yeah. I, look, I mean, so many things. I think it's obviously you learn your subject matter, you learn, you know, your coursework. But I think in school, and again, I'm so grateful for you, is that you learn how to work, right? Well, I didn't have a lot. Of, I didn't have a lot of tolerance. I did not have a lot of tolerance for students who didn't work. That's for sure. That's for sure. Yeah. So we're going to go through a couple of your students. We can't cover everybody, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, but you know, some of these folks here are some really wonderful people and have done a lot of work. Yeah. Right? Dr. Hot, Dr. Sure Hot, like Dr. Hiddle. Hiddle. Yeah, and, and I think uh, Dr. Tanya, who I think is on this call today. And we've I got, got Sarah's son. Yes. Yeah. 
and uh, we've got Dr. Crow. Is oh, here? my buddy Sin Yu Chen. Yeah. He was one of the magnificent students I had. And Leandro Ferreiras from yeah. Brazil, and of course, Dr. Billy Crow, outstanding student too. So they were all outstanding. Also faculty and here. did well. Every one of those students yeah. have done very, very well. We've got a few more photographs. I just, again, I couldn't pick everybody, so I apologize, but we'll go to the next slide. And, you know, just. I, yeah, I, Dr. Hahn, yeah. Uh, she's the leading <laughs> nematologist on the bur, uh, the Bursafalinkus nematoma in Korea. South Korea. Korea. Yes, and uh, there's a whole group. Uh, <laughs> We've got a whole lot of students, but always very welcoming here. Um, lots of social aspect, I think, as well. And obviously, birthdays, and you know, we spend so much Maris time. Maris Aldabiva in Puerto Rico, George Karaoke in Kenya. <laughs> Bless his heart, he came to Florida and had a mishap. That was tragic. Oh, I'm sorry to hear. And um, and I think the next slide. <clears throat> Can you even count on the number of fingers that you've, or I mean, probably not, but do you even remember how many graduations you've been to? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't think I missed many with students who graduated who were going to be here and yeah, went through this ceremony together. That's right. So I think we've got Dr. Payon there is when, when you are. That is, Louis yeah, Payon, so he's... young and handsome. <laughs> that's to you there. <laughs> so that's good. Now I think I'm just going to get it on record here that I have heard in the years past with the early students, life was rough around here with uh, as a student. And I think <laughs> over the years, you have mellowed because I've had these long conversations. Well, I, got, I got smarter, Claudia. <laughs> I think I got you in that intermediate stage, yeah. right? Yeah. But speaking with Dr. Crow, who's here in the department as well, things have softened up. Yeah, they, all, they all did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't get any free degree. Okay? Oh, no, 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 I know. Here you earn your degree. There's no doubt about that. And so after, what, 50 years about? We're going to go to the next one. Um, retirement. I, I, I heard that you were going to retire. And I, I, I frankly couldn't believe it. Right? <laughs> Is when I, I'm like, what? Is he really going to retire? So that was 2019. I was lucky to come here too. I think many of your former students also showed up at retirement, which is Do you great. know the reason that I chose that time to retire? Mm -mm. The vice president made a special offer. And so he said anybody with 35 years or more could uh -huh. retire. He would give them a whole year's of additional salary. Uh -huh. Okay. Golden parachute. So I, to took it, it. I, I took it. I took it. I bought myself a 2019 GMC pickup truck. <laughs> That's awesome. I didn't know that. That is great. But I know you um, still do some work, right? So I think even though you're retired, I, I know you still do lots of collaborations. You go to the next slide. Working with some of the stone fruit growers, right? They're in a, a bit of a predicament, I think. The peach growers, I, I'm collaborating with them, with Dr. Jose Chaparro, the peach mm -hmm. breeder, because he needs input. And so I can grow the nematodes and help him along with that. And then I have a horticultural student that I'm on his committee. Great. I was on his committee before I retired. And so I've continued to yeah. uh, help him with his work. As a matter of fact, he uses my laboratory here that oh, I'm, great. I'm soon going to have to give up. <laughs> but fortunately, we still have the laboratory and the microscopes and uh so yeah i'm still helping out when i can yeah i know you're yeah. active in the um nematology societies as well i've now. been going to the meetings supporting right. the society Just that's wonderful. right we had the international meeting in france and and then i'm going to travel up to anchorage i'm really looking forward to going to anchorage alaska that i've never been to alaska great. the meeting's going to be there in that's september nice. i hope you can go claudia yeah, so we you know we do nematology, not plant parasitic nematology work, but we actually have been doing some nematology work with uh, raccoons and rats. <laughs> so hoping to catch a meeting next year, huh? Uh, talk a little bit about, but really super interesting stuff uh, that's here in New Orleans. And so I'm glad to see that you're still active. And we've got another slide. This is how I will always think of you, right, in the field. I can't tell you how many hours we would spend in the field until it was, you know, late at night checking things yeah. out. You know, back in that day, Claudia, we had 
It was a lot of work to calibrate those people get rigs to. Yeah, a lot of work. It was morning you know. to night. It was, yeah. Morning to night, that's what it was. But I really do feel as though I couldn't have gotten the best training. I got the best training. I, I, it, look, from start to finish, I think about it all the time. Mm -hmm. When things get rough, right, mm -hmm. or things are difficult, I mean, you just work through it. And, you know, <laughs> for me, this is not my interview, but we had a, we were looking for field plots. I don't know if you remember this or not, but we had almost, what, three years in a row one year, the peanut farmer didn't, it was a drought, didn't water my, my fields. And That's then right. another year, pasture, I got hit. It was That's like right. something. Yeah. So you have to really learn how to overcome, right, all yeah. of these challenges. It's it's really challenging to put out good field plots. Yeah. And I think pasture always followed me for some reason. <laughs> but I got it done, which is really good. So anyway, we're wrapping up here, and I'm going to um, put the next slide for, for questions. But... You know, I'm so, again, I've said it 10 times here today, but incredibly grateful for what you have done for well, me. Thank you, Claudia. And, um, you know, everything that I've learned here at the University of Florida as well. So, and well, um, it's paid off. I tell you that. That's great. Yeah, yeah. it really has, which yeah. I think is great. So, Stacey, do you want to check and see? I know we've got an audience. Does anybody have any questions or any comments? I know there's a couple former students on there. I'm going to give a funny story. Um, we're happy to entertain them. Um, there are two comments. One okay. said, Claudia does indeed use a green ink, and rightly so. <laughs> I did. That's what one of my employees said. I definitely use green ink, and I have learned <laughs> from you. And then Mara de Rocha is from the University of Brazil. Uh -huh. And she says she is loving all these stories from Don. She's lucky to, to consider him one of her dear friends, even from such a distance. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, thank you, everybody. I think uh, if there are no more questions, again, Dr. Dixon, thank you for everything and everything that you have done for nematology, done for all of your students, for the University of Florida. You've done so much and, you know, continue. Right. Happy Fourth. <laughs> happy Fourth, everyone. Have a yeah. good time for the Fourth of July. That we're yeah, talking absolutely. about the United States now, yeah. <laughs> around the world. <laughs> Celebrate. Have a good time. And if anybody is interested, we're going to be recording. Um, well, we are recording this presentation, and we're going to be putting it on our YouTube channel. And if anybody wants to be added to our distri email distribution list, our email is education at nola.gov. And everybody, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Dixon. You're welcome. We really appreciate Claudia. your time today. Yeah, Thanks, really everybody. Everybody's time. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. Bye. I'm sorry.